Black pastors demand the removal of a bust of Planned Parenthood's founder from a Washington museum. The National Portrait Gallery says it won't do it. Jason Calvi is there tonight with that story. Brian Margaret Sanger was a pioneer of the birth control movement. She also supported eugenics, the idea to limit reproduction for prisoners and others. Today, a group of pastors say she wanted to use eugenics to limit the black community. So today, they're asking this famous gallery to get rid of her image. The bus got to go. Black pastors and pro-life leaders rally outside the National Portrait Gallery. They want a bust of Margaret Sanger removed from a permanent exhibit. I think that adds insult to injury that she, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, is in the Hall of Justice when she's the founder of an abortion chain that's killed millions upon millions of children. Exterminate the Negro population. Protestant Bishop E.W. Jackson led today's charge. Well, Margaret Sanger was, frankly, a blatant racist who devalued human life and thought that there were people who weren't worthy of life. Uh, and she said that on many occasions. Pro-life activist Ryan Bomberger points to Sanger's autobiography and a speech she gave to the KKK. I don't know how you can possibly say someone is not racist that actually speaks at a KKK rally. And try that today, see, if that, see how that goes for you. The portrait gallery says it's their job to tell the American story, which includes Sanger. People who are anti-abortion usually approach the issue from a moral standpoint. Do you believe abortion in the black community is viewed as a moral issue or a political issue? Both. I think abortion in the black community is viewed as both a moral issue and a political issue. For me, it's more about the politics than the morality, because when you view it from a moral perspective, that leads to condemnation and it leads to judgment. And I don't think that really benefits us as a people. Um, it is not my place to tell a woman what to do with her body. But at the same time, as Africans, we are fundamentally a pro-life people because we understand that when you give birth, that is the reincarnation of an ancestor. That is a life coming to this world with a specific purpose given to it by the Supreme Almighty God. So we have to look at it from the spiritual perspective. You're actually stopping the destiny of the universe and the destiny of the black race by aborting that child. With that being said, if you have a young sister who doesn't have any family support, you have a young sister who's uh, the father of her child, isn't interested in being there, he don't want the child. You have a young sister dealing with poverty and people are constantly telling her that you don't want to have a baby this early. And then you look at the reality that young mothers tend not to graduate high school on time, if at all. Uh, they often tend not to graduate college, if at all. Now we all know dozens of black women who achieved in spite of, but there's so many thousands more who did not. But I think we have to look at the fact that we have aborted over 3 million babies since the 1970s. I mean, we have to look at the fact that Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood International and her Negro project were all part of the American eugenics crusade to get rid of black life. Uh, it, it, it's no secret that 75% of Planned Parenthood abortion centers are located within close proximity to black communities. Even when you look at what Planned Parenthood is doing in the Caribbean, what they're doing in Africa, if you look purely at the numbers. I heard Amos Wilson, Dr. Amos Wilson once say, black people have severe case of myopia, right? Um, a lot of things we say are not there, are here. We just don't see them. Uh, for example, many programs and businesses people black people say that we need are there, but they don't support them. What's your thoughts about that? Well, shout out to Dr. Amos Wilson. I think he was the greatest black psychologist in American history. And I think he was the most relevant black scholar of the second half of the 20th century. And like myself, uh, he was a doctor of clinical psychology and a Garveyite Pan-Africanist. I do believe that we have many institutions and businesses that are not getting the support that they should as black people complain about the need for them. But at the same time, when we're talking about the critical institutions, the banks, the hospitals, the schools, the supermarket, the distribution and manufacturing, I don't believe we have nearly as much as we should. You know, for example, you take the hospitals. We owned and controlled over 500 hospitals in American history. That's nearly one per year. You can hardly find them now. We only have about a handful 
of black hospitals, independent schools, truly independent that operate inside of a traditional school building, not in somebody's basement or kitchen table. You're probably looking at three dozen. Uh, if you look at truly black owned banks, you probably may have about two or three dozen of those. So when you look at the critical institutions, we do have black farmers, but we don't have a network and a relationship between the black farmers and the black communities to get their produce out to us. And of course, we don't have the supermarkets to sell that produce on a regular basis. So when you're talking about the critical institutions, the schools, the banks, the hospitals, the supermarkets, the manufacturing and distribution, we are at a significant loss for those things. The institutions that matter most, we are at a loss for them. Now we have restaurants and barbershops and we need restaurants and barbershops, but they're not critical institutions. Why? Because you can get your hair cut at home. You can cut your own hair. I cut my own hair. I've been doing it since high school because we was trained to do so at my high school. So you can live without a beauty salon. You know, women can do hair in the house. You can live without a restaurant. You can cook your own food in the house. So, you know, although those are, they're good to have, they're good conveniences, they're not necessities. Hospitals save lives. Banks invest and build communities. Supermarkets, you know, build the family, build the body, take care of the dietary nutritional needs. Schools prepare the children. Uh, manufacturing provide our people with their daily necessities. Distribution provides jobs and allow black people to get the things that they need around the planet. Uh, when it comes to critical institutions, we are at a significant loss. After years of observation, right, I've come to the conclusion that sports are destroying our young black brothers, making them delusional, depressed, and hopeless. Um, I've seen this trend where you have a lot of teenagers who are not even on the team, but they have this idea that they're going to college or going to go to the league. I see a lot of young men who are in 25, they're 25 to 30 years old, still saying they're trying to get to the league. Um, during this period now, they're not developing any skills to provide for themselves or, so or society. Also, uh, what you know about parents living through their child, which mm -hmm. contributes to it, and uh, which I know you're going to talk on the amount of attention given to athletes. What are your views about the relationship with sports in the black community? I think that sports are overemphasized in the black community. And I think this ties into a legacy coming from slavery where black men and black women were there. Our worth was determined on our physical attributes. And to a large extent, it's still the same way now. If you are an athlete, the way in which your worth is determined is identical to the way in which the worth of an enslaved African was determined. It was your output, your strength, how fast you could work. You look at the NFL combine, you look at the NBA workouts, it's nothing but a slave plantation. The only difference is you're being paid money, but the power differential between a slave and a slave master and the power differential between the NBA player and the NBA owner or the NFL player and the NFL owner is the exact same as the power differential between a slave and his master. The only difference is they are given money that allows them to live a comfortable life outside of the plantation. But beyond that, it is the same thing as slavery. They don't have no voice. They're afraid. They're timid. Their behavior is strictly controlled. It is slavery. And the only reason why we don't see professional sports as slavery is because the amount of money that they make. And that's because we equate money with power. Money is not power. Money buys you access. Power gives you the ability to control outcomes. These athletes do not control outcomes, and most of them don't even control their own lives. I also think that we have to look at the fact that the black community overvalues sports and athletics, and we undervalue academic excellence. The child who gets straight A's and B's, the child who's mentally gifted, the child who aced his SATs, the child who's in the top 1%, smartest children, you know, best reading scores, math scores, science scores, language scores, they will never get the attention of the basketball standout, even if he's an academic failure. They will never get the attention of a football standout, even if he's an academic failure. He could be failing three classes and he's still gonna get a big trophy at the end of the year for helping him go to the playoffs or win the playoffs. He may have no future after he leaves that school that year, but because he won the championship, got us a trophy, we're gonna put him on a pedestal. But the kid who's likely to come up with a cure for cancer, sitting right in this classroom, is not even going to be mentioned. And so we have to look at how we as a people have allowed public school culture and black community culture 
to overvalue athletes and entertainers and undervalue our children who are academically excellent. That's on us. And then you have to look at the fact that our children don't have access to role models in those careers where they live. The dentists don't live in our neighborhood. The surgeon doesn't live in our neighborhood. The engineer doesn't live in our neighborhood. You barely find black teachers and black principals who live in a predominantly black neighborhood. Most of your black bourgeoisie, your middle class is moving in to a white life. So how are black children going to have access to role models that might make them think twice about wanting to be an athlete or entertainer when they're not around? They're gonna to gravitate to what they see and what do they see in their neighborhood? Aspiring rappers and aspiring inter entertainers and athletes. And what do they see on the television? Rappers who made it and athletes who made it. So whether they're outside on the street or in the house watching YouTube, all they see is black men who overvalue athletics and entertainment, even though these are low potential careers. And what I mean by that is the likelihood of you becoming rich or wealthy or being good enough in athletics or entertainment to live comfortably off it is very slim. You have a greater chance of being struck by lightning than you do of becoming a professional athlete or entertainer. But no one's telling our children this, and this is one of the reasons why I believe we need to bring the industrial building trade programs back into our communities. Because I do believe that even if he wants to be a rapper, even if he wants to be a basketball player, if he doesn't make it and he's a licensed plumber, a licensed electrician, a licensed welder, a licensed auto mechanic, a licensed HVAC contractor, he can still live a decent life for himself. But right now, black boys in inner city schools are only given three options go into the military, become an athlete or an entertainer, or go to jail. And Umar, I wanna to touch on three things before we move on. First thing is this, in regards to basketball, I can speak about, right? I think there are about a quarter million high school boys, seniors in the country. There are only like a thousand something spots. Out of that thousand spots, you have JUCO players coming in, that's probably gonna take 200 or 300. Mm -hmm. You have overseas players. So let's just say there are 600 spots for a quarter million people. Most are not gonna make it. Even if you get the spot, you have to stay there. There's no such thing as a four-year scholarship. Every year you have to renew based on your performance and basically your relationship with the coach at the mm -hmm, end of the day, mm -hmm. right? Another one that part I want to touch on, in defense of people who leave the neighborhood, not single people, but people with children, they want to put their children in a different environment. That's why it's kind of hard to stay, especially if you have, because I have conversations with my peers about this. It's a hard decision to make. Do you want my child to grow up in the environment I grew up in? Or do I want my child to grow up in another environment? There are pros and cons to both. Because if they don't grow up in my environment, they're missing out on stuff. But at the same time, they're not being exposed to stuff. And when you mm. put them in a different environment, suburban, white environment, uh, they're missing out on stuff. But at the same, they're exposed to stuff, but they're not they're exposed to other stuff. So it's like a two-edged sword in a sense, you know? Here's what I would say. If I had to make the decision between, and I'm gonna start with school and go to community, but if I had to make the decision between putting my child in a white private school versus a black inner city school, I would probably go with the black inner city school. The academics are going to suffer, but I can supplement that myself at home. But if I put my child in a white suburban school and they destroy my child's self-esteem, he or she may never recover. And I've actually seen this happen as a school psychologist where the self-esteem and the self-belief and the concept of our children were destroyed in a year's time at a white private school and sometimes the children never recover. So for me, I think it is safer from a psychological perspective for them to remain in the hood versus go into the suburbs. Now, in terms of safety of my family, it is a tough decision. And I would not criticize a black person parents who took their children out of the ghetto and put them in a white suburb if they were actively trying to remake that ghetto into the community that it needs to be. My issue is not so much about where you raise your children as it is about what is your commitment to creating the thriving black communities that we need. To move out and turn your back on the black community, that's an insult. But if you say I'm moving out because I cannot afford for my daughter to be snatched up and I can't afford for my son to be murdered senselessly, but I'm still in the community playing my role for the children and I'm doing whatever I can to fight against gentrification and homelessness and crime 
in, in, in high school dropout. I can respect that because although your family does not sleep in the hood, you are still active in the hood. I can respect that. But a lot of what I see are black families who abandon the black community totally once they get out into the white suburb. And we got to keep in mind, you can be abducted in the suburbs just like you'd be abducted in the ghetto. You can be killed in the suburb just like you can be killed in the ghetto. So a black man and woman are safe nowhere in America. But again, I can understand that move to the suburbs for the babies. I can understand it. But you yourself should never abandon the community. And I, and I respect that, right?